We have Brent Auberman, who is not the person listed on the paper, so he's confusing me already. Thanks very much. The uh, originally scheduled presenter, Dr. Gary Morak, recently, recently completed his doctorate and uh, was hired away from us by ARS. So uh, as a result, he has given me the privilege of presenting his work. But as is usual, uh, I always do a little last minute tweaking. And uh, having been at the conference now for a little while and being exposed to a lot of the presentations, it gave me a pause, gave me uh, occasion to do a little bit of thinking uh, about where the organization goes from here. Um, the Environmental Learning Center, uh, and I'm kind of on the outside looking in, just as a, as a run-of-the-mill participant uh, from time to time, we operate primarily over here with the occasional bleed over into the economies sector of, of this picture. The picture really is drawn uh, to communicate the idea that we know of now as the triple bottom line of sustainability. So we talked about uh, environmental sustainability. We've really only wrestled one beast to the ground. And if the, uh, the conferences that we go to routinely are any indication, we really haven't wrestled that beast all the way to the ground by itself, much less in the larger context of the, of the systems, the social systems, and the economies within which these operations are embedded. So we've got the livestock and poultry operations here that most of the work that we're presenting is going on over here with a little bit of bleed over into the economies, but almost nothing other than uh, some of the work related to small farms. But in, in large measure, we have not really done a tremendous amount here. And yet, a, a sustainability paradigm that is now widely accepted is that there is no such thing as sustainability unless the sustainability uh, is a property in all three of those systems simultaneously. And so um, that's really the context in which I want to think about the work that Dr. Mark did for his PhD dissertation. Uh, now, cross your eyes uh, really, really hard and look at this diagram. Don't squint at it and try to focus on it. I'd like for you to cross your eyes. Uh, right here in the middle is a node that I've titled uh, United States Livestock and Poultry Intensification. Just take that for what it is. It is what it sounds like. There are three other uh, major nodes in bold here, and uh, this is social sustainability, this is environmental and natural resource sustainability, and economic sustainability. And what we've done here, Dr. Diot and I uh, spent some time trying to sketch out the intricate web of causality of cause and effect, of influence, of recursive and nonlinear influences, that is, feedbacks and delays, the kinds of dynamics in the larger system that give it a really interesting character and that causes things, that, that kind of intricate character gives things a decidedly unpredictable or at least difficult to predict nature. That is, we can predict the weather a couple of days hence with a pretty great precision, but uh, another week or two down the road, all bets are off. Well, the same kind of thing is true about a system like this. So we've got for the need for economies of scale that drive, for example, the intensification of the industry, or environmental regulation that eats into the profit margin, that increases the need for the economy. Right here is a, a reinforcing loop that drives us in the direction of greater intensification, all the while embodying dynamics like environmental regulation that are a reaction to intensification. And yet that very, intens uh, that very intensification of regulatory pressure drives additional need for economies of scale, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a spiraling, well, there are a bunch of other dynamics that balance that. There are social dynamics, there are environmental dynamics, there are self-limiting things like aquifers that are running dry or uh, peak oil or anything like that. So this picture really conveys at least the start of what we might think of as an embedded, uh, deeply embedded web of, let's, let's call it mutual causality in which livestock and poultry operations are embedded. Now, that sounds really pointy-headed, but what I'm trying to get across here is that when we do work 
in these very narrow areas where causalities are easy to tease out. I push this button and this happens. I manage the monoslope barn this way and this happens. All of that actually ends up occurring over time in a very much, a much larger web of social and economic systems that react to those changes. So I, when tax rates change, I change my financial behavior. Uh, and so what is projected to be revenue is not that revenue anymore because I reacted to that. Well, uh, you can see uh, in many of diagrams, these causal loop diagrams that appear from time to time in the literature, a big portion of what gives rise to interesting behavior is not the water flows or the energy flows, but the human behaviors that react to those things and try to manage them and mitigate them and enhance them and reinforce them and then come back and have perverse consequences down the road. Human behavior, human agency is really, I think, the wave of our future collectively in the Livestock and Poultry Environmental Learning Center. So that's a long-winded introduction. I won't spend a lot more time, too much detail, but I want to give you a uh, kind of a, a look at some of the tools we might put together now in order to model a system uh, excuse me, that looks like this rather than a system that looks like a single black box with two controllers and an output. Um, the project that Gary worked on was modeling manure flows in the Texas Panhandle in response to fertilizer, fertilizer prices, biofuel demand, and other externalities. What you'll see in just, in just a moment is that we're mapping uh, and trying to understand how manure would get allocated in a certain region of the United States in response to new competitive forces that are turned loose by uh, the increased demand for biofuels. So uh, we ask a, a group of systems, one class at West Texas a and we have a systems agriculture PhD program. We ask one of the uh, core class uh, cohorts there to uh, address a, a class, evaluate the economic feasibility of a manure-fueled corn ethanol plant in the Texas Panhandle. At the time, Panda Energy had built a plant that was designed to run off either natural gas or gasified manure, and uh, uh, then generate 105, 115 million gallons per year of ethanol. Um, and the manure demand there um, was a, a point of some interest to us. So uh, we were asking questions like, under what condition would it be economically feasible to fuel an ethanol plant with manure in the panhandle? Now, we began to think about this, uh, and it became quickly apparent that there were going to be a lot of layers uh, to answering the question. Uh, the easy ones are the mass and energy layers. Those are the things that are conserved. They're easy to write equations that have constraints because the laws of conservation simply will not be mocked. So mass and energy, that's the easy part, and that's where we started. Uh, then uh, we looked at, uh, we, we said clearly there's an environmental layer in this that is distinct from but tied dynamically to the whatever is happening in mass and energy. Of course, we're operating in a market framework uh, to a lesser extent or a greater extent uh, modified by policy and other uh, types of externalities. So it's a complicated stew of uh, different dynamics that we would need to model to understand a complicated system like the Texas Panhandle. Here are the things that we considered, that Gary considered and his team uh, considered over time over the last five years in the mass and energy layer. We we're primarily interested in where manure goes. But of course, distiller's grains are a byproduct that get fed back to the cattle, so there's an immediate feedback. What happens to the manure when you start feeding distiller's grains? And what happens to the, uh, the production of uh, the, the, the attributes of distiller's grains when you start uh, doing various things uh, using various feeding strategies, et cetera. Uh, interaction of water, we're on an aquifer that's depleting rapidly and not recharging, at least in our area of the country. Natural gas, uh, we have been treating this as an inexhaustible input. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe not, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but in any case, uh, we would need to figure that in, particularly if manure was going to substitute for it. And then, of course, we, we grow corn, uh, in the, our area, but uh, we're using groundwater to do it, and we can just as easily rail corn in from the Midwest. So uh, how would the dynamics that are going on in the Texas Panhandle as water is depleted, groundwater is depleted, and irrigation ebbs, 
what happens to the corn dynamics and how does that relate to all of this? And then we've got to dispose of ash as well. So all of these things are in the mass and energy layer. Here's what it looks like distilled to its very simplest form. We've got the, what was called at the time the Panda ethanol plant producing in red distiller strains, some of which leave the system, some of which get fed in our complex of feed yards in the Texas Panhandle. Uh, the feed yards themselves are uh, taking in corn from land management units both locally and in the, in the corn belt. So we've got corn coming in. Uh, these land management units may be in the Panhandle or they might be in Illinois or Nebraska. Anyway, that corn comes in, goes to the feed yard. Some of it goes to the Panda ethanol plant. And then manure is coming out of the feed yard and it's either going to the ethanol plant for biofuel uh, or it's coming down here to the land management unit. And that brown, that set of brown pathways there uh, is the, the, the first flow that we wanted to grapple with in terms of its, uh, uh, not only its mass flows, but the economics of it. And to start building, what we're trying to do now is build a modeling framework in which we could begin to answer questions in which there are lots of feedbacks, uh, human behaviors, policies, uh, and economic layers as well. This is the kind of the canonical structure that shows up when you have a, um, uh, a commodity that is in demand by two competing industries. So there is nothing unique about this, really. Uh, but what we're trying to do here in this project is, is come up with a way of modeling and predicting how feed yard manure will move uh, to land management units and to the ethanol plant as biofuel demand uh, ebbs and flows and as uh, the availability of, of uh, water for corn production, etc. cetera, uh, irrigation at all, uh, irrigated anything. Uh, we can use a lot more manure on LMUs that have irrigation than on LMUs that do not. So uh, this whole thing is in flux in the Texas Panhandle. It has a canonical shape that applies anywhere, uh, but it has a specific embodiment in the Texas Panhandle because of the constraints that are on the, on the system in which this is embedded. These are all of the kinds of variables that would, would influence, we think, where manure goes. Uh, things like the higher heating value demand of the ethanol plant, the manure production rate, the time of year, it's going to be seasonal, there are going to be delays and stockpiles and timing issues. The price of fossil fuel will be a huge driver of whether or not manure goes here or here, um, or it may not. That's what we'd like to know. Um, there's always the environment layer, and we've been talking about that uh, exhaustively here at the conference. So uh, here's a couple of uh, ideas about how we would begin to model uh, the human behavior aspect. Obviously, economic modeling is nothing new. Uh, been going on for a long, long, long time. Uh, but in terms of integrating into dynamic models where we can predict uh, we can try to predict behaviors and outcomes in different uh, uh, scenarios. It's, I guess it's not new, but it has not been done uh, in our context in any sustained way. So um, we're looking again at fertilizer value and fuel value and uh, allowing markets to help us dictate where manure flows in response to those things. Uh, we began to deal a little bit with game theory. One, one of the things I'd like to see us uh, uh, as a community begin to interact with is the, the game theoretic uh, scientists out there, the people that learn, uh, that, that teach us how to, um, how to solve problems like the, the, the prisoner's dilemma in, uh, that, uh, what was the, the recent movie with the Joker as Batman, where they had the boats, the two fairies, and they were going to, they had to blow each other up or they would get blown up. Those kinds of prisoner's dilemmas. It, it, it turns out that those kinds of ethical dilemmas and, and uh, more broadly speaking, just the whole prisoner's dilemma archetype shows up everywhere in our, in our systems. And uh, we need game theoretic tools to help us predict uh, what the most, um, what, what the wisest play is for a rational person. What is the wisest play for a rational person in light of a carbon market in a certain setting? Those are the kinds of games that we're talking about. So game theory specialists would be helpful for us, and we began to bring a bit of that sensibility to the transaction modeling. Uh, we wanted to grapple with the marginal uh, value of nutrients and quit claiming uh, financial credit for, um, uh, for phosphorus that was applied in the form of manure at rates exceeding the phosphorus requirement of the crops. And the same thing might be true about nitrogen for different crops. 
we wanted to embody that in our economic layers. Uh, the manure is a fuel source um, determined by three main things. Um, actually, these are the two most important, but it turns out that including distiller's grains in a feedlot diet changes the higher heating value of the manure that results. So you've got ash content and moisture that drive uh, the, the fuel value of, of manure, but then you've got feedlot management and feed management uh, decisions that also affect that. How does that play out over time? Uh, one of the things that we have been tracking uh, that has been interesting is that up until 2006, 2008, uh, there was a very strong coupling between the prices of natural gas and the price of ammonia, uh, anhydrous ammonia fertilizer, very strongly coupled, as you can see. And then the coupling uh, gave way about 2008, and these two charts now out here uh, now have, have diverged and aren't necessarily correlated with one another anymore. Interesting phenomenon. Could we have predicted that, and what would be the implications of that? What are the implica implications of these two things being coupled and what are the implications of those two things being uncoupled for the next 15 years? How does that affect the value of manure as a fertilizer, as a phosphorus substitute, as a nitrogen substitute? So all of these considerations, we, we're doing some work in Stella to do some dynamic modeling, but this is what a manure value calculator might look like. It's a complicated mess. Once we uh, create a module that computes the relative value of, of uh, manure as fertilizer and manure as a biofuel feedstock in a particular setting, then that would get fed into a larger model that deals with the markets themselves. <clears throat> but we're trying to put a bunch of tools together. Here's, a, here's another game theoretic idea. Any of you work on eBay at all? You buy and sell on eBay. You're always thinking about strategies. How should I price this? Where should I bid this? What is my uh, what is the price, the maximum price I'm willing to pay as a buyer? What is my bid price ought to, what ought my bid price to be as a seller? What is the uh, asking price that I'm going to come to the table with? What is the price that I'm willing to accept? And given those four values, then can we come up with a way of devising uh, a a way of predicting human behavior on the basis of how reticent they are about? Uh, uh, making purchases that they regret, or how aggressive are they going to be in bidding? Uh, how quickly will they move from, will the buyer move from this point to that point in terms of uh, uh, negotiating and the iterations therein? So we'd like, this is a game theoretic problem with a lot of different bearings. And we'd like to know, we'd like to be able to predict where the market ends up here. Where are the, where are the prices that are most probable in this, in this arrangement, and how do they move with the externalities like, new, uh, like natural gas prices, etc. We've got a lot of different market structures to deal with. Kelly Zaring has helped us uh, design uh, flow charts for making decisions of this kind. What, uh, how do we model the market as a monopoly or a monopsony or just a, a market clearing uh, situation? Um, so. All of that came together in Gary's work in, in the form of a market simulator. And it had some policy layers uh, related to things like this. Uh, we first determined the market type. Are there a lot of sellers or just one seller, et cetera? But then the next kind of decision was, do I, as a producer, do I need to reduce my manure volume in response to some, oh, I don't know, some regulatory requirement? If so, uh, then I would skip all of this manure value. The manure has essentially a zero value at that point, and we go to a transaction model and find out where the best place to go with that for the least cost to the producer. Uh, but if uh, there is no need to reduce volume on the basis of some external condition, then we look uh, on site, see if there's any storage remaining. If, if I've got plenty of storage for the manure that I'm producing, then I'm not in uh, as great a rush to sell it. I can, I can essentially forward, uh, 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 I can hedge my bets by storing the manure and wait for a more favorable time to sell it when I can get a higher price for it. That's the kind of decision that we would want to make on the basis of uh, storage capacity. Once we've uh, grappled with that, if I don't have any storage remaining, I still got to get rid of the manure. The price is probably zero and I've got to pay to get it moved. But if I've still got storage remaining, then I can hold on to it or I can sell it, depending on how favorable the market is. And at that point, we, uh, we delve into the manure value calculator that calculates the equivalent value as a biofuel, the equivalent value as a, uh, as a fertilizer, 
and then uh, look for all of the possible places I could sell that in the LMU surrounding. Well, um, it's a complicated, complicated mess. Here was the test area. I'm about to wrap up. I just want to give you a, a bird's eye view of what we've done thus far to try to piece all of these things together. Uh, this is Hereford, Texas. In this county, there are about a million, uh, million head of cattle on feed. Uh, and uh, Gary took all of the, um, the feedlots in this bubble area um, that represent first all the feedlots and dairies within a 30 mile manure hauling radius from the, uh, from the plant and then drew a 20 mile circle around each one of those and when you overlay them you get a, a bubble like that and uh, so we put together all of these uh, all of these feedlots and then all digitized all of the land management units in that bubble uh, that took uh, several months as Kevin can attest back there so in any case, uh, we put all of this into a, a GIS model um, that calculates hauling distances, hauling costs. We've got the externalities coming in in the form of natural gas prices, uh, manure, I mean, excuse me, fertilizer equivalencies, the cost of anhydrous, etc. And relating uh, all of those uh, together in a simple optimization model, I'll show you what it looks like. Um, uh, there are times, uh, across here we've got all the feedlots and dairies, there were 62 of them, and there were 400 some odd LMUs vying for the use of that manure. And uh, the yellow in each row represents the, the CAFO that could provide manure to that LMU at the least cost. So there's only one yellow box in any row, that is any LMU competing for manure would only have one least cost CAFO to provide it. But any particular CAFO might be able to satisfy uh, any number of LMUs, depending on how close by they were and, and uh, things such as that. So we had to find a way of, of allocating manure. There's a, a lot of mathematical detail in that. But what I'd like to get across here by, by way of wrapping up is just to offer the idea that over time we'd like to, I, I think we'd like to see the LPELC become an LPSLC by bringing in uh, uh, capabilities that are beyond the engineering and animal science and crop science, people that know how to integrate modeling across all of the domains that I've been talking about here. We're just at the very front end of this. And uh, so I, I think that uh, we have an opportunity now to, to look ahead. Now we've had the, the big event here in Denver. We have an opportunity now to look ahead, chart a course for Livestock and Poultry Sustainability Learning Center, in which we begin to do a, a better job of, of uh, putting our work in context.